We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. I was so excited to get my shipment from Last Bottle Wines in the mail the other day full of incredible red wines all from Napa Valley. I love wine tasting, so having this to my door couldn't be happier. Also couldn't be more excited that today's episode is brought to you by Last Bottle Wines. If you don't know already, they're a Napa-based online wine shop with a twist. They offer just one hand-picked wine per day until it sells out, and they're always at incredible prices. We're talking talking 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part is that there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase. And I could not be more excited to bring this offer right now because they're having a marathon sale, which is coming up March 28th and 29th. Even better, we're offering Datable listeners 10% off your first order with code Datable. So if you are a wine lover like me, this is a great time to join. And did I mention that shipping is 100% free? So so what are you waiting for? Mark your calendar for March 28th and 29th or get on it earlier if you want. You can sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use code DATABLE and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Xu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the Dateable Podcast, where we dig into the ins and outs of modern dating, but also the whys, hows, and what's of people's behavior. We're on it. Yes, we have an episode that's coming soon of why the what needs to be the question, not the why. So we'll leave it at that. We'll let you all be intrigued mm-hmm. for a few weeks, but it's a good one. We always have good ones, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. What else is new? I'm saying I have a favorite episode, you know, the usual. Every week. <laughs> well, this week's episode is completely relatable for so many people. It's about dating a workaholic, or maybe you are in a workaholic dating, uh, because all of us are have been trying to make work and life and dating all work together the last few years, especially a lot of us working from home, which Mm -hmm. I've heard that makes you work even more because there's no separation of home and work. So I found this this episode especially relevant. Yeah, someone actually asked me earlier, has this always been a thing? Or do you think it's new for the pandemic? And I think dating someone that's a workaholic or being a workaholic has been around forever. But it just showed up in different ways with the pandemic. We're going to go into it today with our guest Caitlin, who is was dating a workaholic. And the industry that he worked in was supply chain, Mm. which I think different industries got hit differently in the pandemic, too. 
that there's a lot just going on in the world that is outside of relationships. And we also differentiate too of being invested in your career versus being a workaholic. And Mm -hmm. they're two very different things. And we also find out that your work culture bleeds into your personal life culture. And a lot of what we experience at work, if we don't leave it at work, it does show up in our personal lives, especially in dating. And the reason why I say that is because I'm at my parents' house right now. Whenever I'm at my parents' house, I get very nostalgic and I think about old memories, right? And I remember this guy I was dating in New York and I couldn't remember how we broke up or why we broke up because he was wonderful and we had a great relationship. So I dug through my emails because our (laughs) final goodbyes were through email and it was shocking because I totally blacked this out. We broke up because he was working and going to school at the same time. So he Mm. could not make time for a relationship. And I at the time was trying to be an actress and a TV host. So my schedule was really erratic and I'd go on auditions during the day and I'd be at home waiting for him to be done with work. And the point of contention for us was that our schedules never matched up. Mm. I ended up blaming this on him not creating time for us. And his side of the story was that he felt so much pressure from me because he couldn't keep up with my lifestyle because he was so busy with work and and school that he felt like he could not live up to my expectations of what a good boyfriend would be. And it's really interesting, our back and forth in the email, I blame him for a lot of it. He blames me back. And at the end, it was like, it was a very defeated response for him that was basically like, I guess we can never be friends or be in contact Damn. because it seems like you're just <laughs> so over this. But I couldn't believe it because in my mind, my memory was we were in such a great relationship with so much fun. I totally forgot that we had misaligned schedules and also misaligned needs. Well, scheduling can be a bitch and that can really make or break. I think every relationship does need quality time. And, you know, it's one of those things. I think we all have those breaking points in those moments that we realize that career isn't everything. And I'm speaking for someone that maybe identifies a little bit as a workaholic. And there's been times that I've thrown myself into work and really Mm. made that the number one priority. And I think it's hard because it's easy to be like, if they wanted to, they would. Yeah. But I do think it's when you're hitting them also. And I don't know if this relationship you had was more in your 20s early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, a lot of us are using those formative years after college to really establish ourselves in our careers. Mm -hmm. Like I know for me, I really wasn't dating until the late 20s because I was so so career focused. And from an early age, I got drilled into my mind, just make sure you can support yourself. Mm -hmm. Everything else will come after that. So that was always a priority for me. And you know, that's what brings me to current day where I'm freezing my eggs, because you know, everything happened a little later than I think you think growing up. And in today's world, especially with women really focused on career, there's a reason why these corporate companies are giving benefits like egg freezing and ways to keep you in the corporation longer. And, you know, a big part of why someone asked me or Janice, our moderator, made a comment that she thought it was interesting that I was freezing my eggs having With a very partner. serious yeah. partner, where most of the time she's heard of it being when you're single. And I totally get when you're single because you just want to, you don't know what's going to happen, all that. But I think for me, it was, it became more real that this was something I potentially want down the road because I could see it. And And I think currently it's like I am focused on my career. I am focused on different aspects that I want to grow in the next couple of years. So having that extra time, which is what egg freezing affords you, that's why companies are shelling out thousands of dollars to do this. It makes sense. It's balancing it all, right? And so you're done with the process, right? Give us an update. I am done. (laughs) I feel relieved. You know, it went really well. Um, It actually was better than I expected in terms of results of what they originally told me. So it was really great. I woke up from the anesthesia and I was like, I need to fall back asleep so I can go into the operating room. (laughs) And then I realized I was already done. (laughs) So fast. It was real fast. It was 10 to 15 minute procedure. I mean, I was there for two hours total. Yeah. More time to prep and then they give you time to rest. I honestly had the best nap of my life. (laughs) It was fantastic. So... (laughs) 
you know, all said and done, everyone has a different experience. It was very positive for me. I'm glad I did it. There's even a chance I might do it again for like better odds, you know, mm-hmm. because I think the reality that I'm thinking too is this is the plan B, but the older you get and the more you focus on other parts of your life, it may become the plan A. And that's the beauty of science that it can be a plan. It can be an option down the road if you have prioritized other stuff like career and other aspects of life. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that we all we are really wanting these days is the option, right? It's not like Mm -hmm. even if we don't necessarily thought about us wanting it, we still want the option of wanting it. Yeah. Kate Kennedy, we did this full deep dive for anyone that missed it. It was last season, the decision to have kids or not. So if you're new and these updates have been interesting, you can get a lot more in that episode. But one of the things that she talked about, this paradox that the older you get, the more financially secure you get, the Mm -hmm. more your career is thriving, the least likely it is to have children. And it's almost like the time that you're ready, you're not ready because you're building up these other areas. And it almost is like the cards are stacked against you. Yeah, my friend May has been trying to convince me to have kids. And she had her first kid at 40, her second kid around 42. And her recent text to me was, listen, you're probably afraid to be an older parent. That's good because you have the means to do so. You have more self-awareness. Yeah. You're more confident in your career. You won't feel like you're stuck in a relationship and you won't feel like you're stuck in whatever uh, stress that you're going through because you have the wherewithal to 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 work through like the challenges as opposed to when you're younger. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that is a really good point. I mean, to me, I I just feel like oh, down the line, if I'm 60 years old trying to chase down a 20 year old, will I keep up? But she also made the good point is like, we're also a generation so focused on our health that we are going to be healthier 60 year olds than our parents. Yeah. So we are more armored with like the the health and the benefits um to to chase after our kids you know even when we're older yeah i think for me it's time the amount of time i have in my life i almost feel like this podcast is our baby that i don't know how i would work a full-time job and do this podcast if i had a kid right like this yeah. it's almost like the time that i'm spending on this makes up for the fact that i don't have a child to care for and i think for so long long, I do still get a lot of satisfaction out of career. And that means so much to my identity. And, you know, I'm. <laughs> we have another episode coming up where we figure out what's sabotaging your love life. Mm-hmm. And I identified as the overachiever, which I now realize how it's hurting me in certain ways. So that's, that's going to be a good one, too. But I think in all of life, like that's been so much of my focus that it's hard to imagine, you know, shifting to this world where your job is to care for other people. And, you know, I just had um, two friends over a little bit ago, and one of them brought her four-month-old, and the other one brought her dog. (laughs) And I was like, this is the life I don't have yet, you know? (laughs) But it's, there's so much beauty of that life, too. And I think I'm just starting to see that. And it's taken me a while. And that's the part that's the paradox, right? The less time you have when you need to see it. I think the fascinating part about you and I, it's just funny that we're aligned on this is that we didn't think about kids without a partner. Yeah. And we both met someone that we can picture kids with. I don't know what it feels like to just picture life with kids regardless of the partner. But I definitely feel a stronger connection to kids now that I'm with a partner I can see having kids with. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people that's an underlying struggle with dating too that maybe you and I haven't had as much experience with is this, I know I want to have kids. I know I want to prioritize my career, but you know, the clock is ticking and I'm not meeting someone and that can be so stressful. And, you know, again, I, I think everyone needs to make their decision on the freezing your eggs, but there is, I've heard people People say it does alleviate some of that pressure to find someone right away when Mm. you know you want kids no matter what. You know, I heard something really interesting from my friend Ryan. I'm going to give him a shout out and you know him, uh, Julie. So my friend Ryan just came back from over a year living in Taiwan. And he said in Taiwan, if you get divorced and you have kids, the kids automatically go to the dad. 
be- wow. because they want women to have a higher chance of remarrying and they know that their chances are lower if they are single mothers. So isn't that interesting? They immediately default to the dad and the the woman would have to fight really hard to get full custody or even partial custody. So this way, society is saying this allows for women to remarry. Fascinating. That is fascinating. I mean, I think I'm also always fascinated at the stats of the gender pay gap Mm. is actually between men and women. It's not that much difference. But where it becomes different is women with children. Mm -hmm. That's when there is a huge pay gap in you know, it. Th- I think we just can't, we'd be naive to say that having kids doesn't affect your career. I think, you know, there's some people that can make it all work, but it's hard to do it all. Yeah, being on the receiving end of recruiting and hearing <laughs> recruiters talk about, oh, woman being of a childbearing age, should we stay away, has been a real discussion. Damn. Yes, it's not legal, but I've definitely heard it. it and then in China, it's completely legal to think that way. So in China, I think you get a years off for a maternity leave. So a lot wow. of companies will stay away from women in their late 20s and early 30s for that reason. That is wild. wild. I feel like that is so illegal, but that is wild. And, you know, I think people do have different perceptions of women that are single. There's this feeling like they have more time to be spending on work, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, unfair in different ways. I feel like when you have kids, pretty much anything you say that, oh, I need to attend to my kid or I need to do this. It's like, great, go for it. If you were ever to say, I need time off to prep for a date, people would laugh at you. And they'd be like, hell no. You know, like there's no there's no grace for single people at all. It's more just work, workload, continue it. It's like they there's this myth that single people just want to keep working and they have all this free time to work all the time. Oh, that is such bullshit. And that is so related to this episode. (laughs) And that is so related to our question for this episode. Someone wrote in and said, I'm seeing someone right now who keeps saying that they're busy with work. What should I do? about this person. (sighs) Haven't we all been there before? I know I certainly have. (laughs) You know, at the end of the day, their priority is not you. Whether that's an accurate statement that they are too busy with work or it's an excuse. I think sometimes we justify work as a way out of other things. It's an easy one to say, I don't have time because I'm working. It's almost like taking care of kids. It, It feels justified that people can understand that reasoning. It almost doesn't matter because at the end of the day, they're not giving you what you want. I think you could have a conversation with them and say like, hey, I'm at a place in my life. I'm looking for a committed relationship where I spend quality time with my partner. I'm really like excited about you and where this is going, but I feel like that part's missing. What can we do about it and see how they react to it? That's the only thing you can do in this situation. People who pour their heart and soul into work are people who somewhat have an avoidant tendency towards relationships. So we hear this from people who love to go to work because they have more control at work, they have more power at work, and they don't feel that they have that in their relationships, or they don't know how to communicate the needs that they need in a relationship to their partner. So then they just, again, avoid it by getting work in in the way and using that as as an excuse. But like what Julie just said, anybody who pours so much of their time into work is not prioritizing you. And it's at this point, there's no need to even ask why are you doing that at work? Mm -hmm. It's proof it's in the pudding. Action speaks louder than words. And if you're seeing an imbalance of time spent between work and you, then you kind of know where you stand here. So I think in this situation, it is important to have a heart to heart conversation with your partner and and say, listen, I want to be a priority too. But if work right now is what you want to prioritize, I respect that. That's not what I'm looking for. And I think we should respectfully, you know, exit out of this relationship. I agree with most things. I'm not sure if I agree that it's always an avoidant tendency. Mm. I think that can be one for sure. But I think some of it is, you know, if you... I'm just thinking about like from the overachiever perspective, if you've historically haven't had good results in the dating world, but in career, you're always promoted, you're always told that you're really great at your job, you're gonna funnel more energy into that aspect of life because Mm. you can see the direct correlation. Also, depending on where you are financially, it might be that you have to work 
Like that might not be a luxury to cut back on work, or maybe you just have bad boundaries. You're a people pleaser. You can't say no to people at work. So you can't make those lines of personal life and professional life. So I think there's many reasons why someone could be spending a lot of time at work and prioritizing work. So that's why I think having it as an open question and getting to the root of like what is driving them is so important. And then you can know how to proceed because I think we can't assume that every Everyone that dives into work is just avoiding relationships either. There is something to be said about people who are in good relationships that it becomes a default. So then they don't feel like they have to work towards that relationship. So then they pour that energy into their work, right? So it's like, oh, I have, I'm dating someone. I'm good. I don't need to think about that yeah. category. I can just focus on my work now. And I hate to be on the receiving end of that because you're like, wait, we, we created this good relationship and now you're basically throwing it away. I mean, I felt myself start to think that way yeah. when we were looking at like New Year's resolutions and I had to stop and be like, nope, this doesn't ever stop. It's not that you just got the partner and now it's done and you can move on to another area of life. I really think it's if you want all these factors facets of life, you need to find the way that you can balance them. Mm -hmm. And that might mean that you don't give 120% to work. Maybe you dial it down to 80% and you could still be killing it at your job and progressing your career that way. And sometimes more time doesn't always mean that you're actually giving better results either. Sometimes being smart and work is knowing what to focus on and what not to focus on. So I think it's getting really clear of what's important to you as the person maybe working too much and then the person that's on the receiving end and seeing how you can learn to balance better if both of you want to go that route. Well, we have so much more info in this episode all about this topic. You know, we go into it all and, you know, there's no wrong way or right way to do any of this. It's all what works for you. But I think with the big point of this episode is it's great to be career oriented, but not necessarily at the expense of everything else in your personal life. Mm. There's always a balance that needs to happen. Everything in moderation, guys. Everything in moderation. Yep. That's that's where the word uh, aholic comes from, right? It's the same as alcoholic or any other type of aholic. It's the obsessive compulsiveness of it, not that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so time for some announcements. We are so excited that we've been having the cameos roll in lately. We just recorded one right before this, and we love how creative you all are getting with the cameos, you know, for people's birthdays, when your friend breaks up with someone, getting them pumped up for a date or yourself. We've had a few that people have written in for their own first date pump up and then some for their friends that are getting back in the game. So there's been so many creative ways to use Cameo and we've just loved recording these. And also, if you just want to like call out a ghoster, call out someone who wronged you, we're so good at that. (laughs) You don't have to do it. (laughs) We'll do it for you. We're here for it. We're here for it. We haven't done those yet, but we are here for it and ready to go. Be our first. Take our virginity on that one. (laughs) So you can find us on Cameo uh, just by searching for a dateable podcast. We'll be the first one that pops up. Awesome. Okay, other announcements. Love in the Time of Corona is our Facebook group. The Sounding Board is our premium group. Reminder to register at datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. We'll let you into all the weekly sound offs, the office hours with the two of us. But you do need to go through that website to get in. So just a PSA again. So we're not ignoring you. I want to say that every week because I don't want all the people that are pending to think that we're ignoring them, but no. there is an extra step there. And then at Dateable Podcast is our us on Instagram and TikTok. We need to grow our following on TikTok. So help us out. We're fucking everywhere. Okay. Just we're <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Okay, and let's do a few quick messages from our partners for this episode. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Relationships take work, especially the most important one you have in your life, your relationship with yourself. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about. We'll go out of our way to treat other people well. But how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? So this month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you that you matter just as much as everyone else does. And therapy is a great way to make sure you show up for yourself. 
For me, therapy has been an eye-opening experience because I didn't realize how much I needed the support and tools to process my feelings. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and dateable listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash dateable. That's betterhel dot com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. This episode is made possible by ZocDoc. Finding and booking a doctor who's right for you doesn't need to be a terrible experience. Will they take your insurance, understand your needs, or be available when you can see them? With ZocDoc, the answer can be a refreshingly pain-free yes. ZocDoc is a free app that shows you doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them. You simply just go to ZocDoc.com, choose a time slot, and whether you want to see the doctor in person or do a video visit. And just like that, you you're booked. And that's exactly how I found my new doctor after moving to LA. Every month, millions of people use ZocDoc, and I'm one of them. It's my go-to whenever I need to find and book a doctor. Finding a quality doctor really shouldn't be that complicated. ZocDoc makes a search so much more pleasant. For our listeners, go to ZocDoc.com slash dateable and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then start your search for a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z O ocdoc.com slash d-a-t-e-a-b-l-e zocdoc.com slash dateable okay let's hear it from caitlin about dating a workaholic In this time of working from home, especially, I feel like it's so easy for people to be workaholics and be busy, busy all the time. What's funny is people tend to use working and being busy as an excuse to not be fully present when they're dating. So I'm curious to hear your stories, Caitlin. Who Who is Caitlin? She's 34 years old. She lives in Florida, originally from Houston, Texas, currently hooking up and having fun and dating someone but haven't defined the relationship. So all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> when you have to check those. Welcome, Caitlin. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, y'all. Ah, there's a Texan coming out. <laughs> I love this topic because I do agree with what you said. Anyway. I think the lines of work and life are very much blurred with this new world that we're in, too. But also, it, on one side, you want to balance your career and balance relationships. So it's not always a bad thing. I was curious what the formal definition of a workaholic was. So I looked it up. So it is most researchers define a workaholic as a person who works excessively and compulsively and is unable to detach from work. And I think that's important because mm. we all define working a lot very differently based on our own definitions of work. So yeah, I guess, Caitlin, maybe to start off, let's spill the tea. I want to hear a little more about the current situation you're in with a workaholic. Situation would be the best <laughs> way to describe it. Um, I just listened to your episode about situationships and I thought, oh yeah, this is me and this workaholic right now. <laughs> <laughs> so about a month ago, um, it was about the last week at my job. I am switching jobs, which is why I moved to Florida from California. And there was a very high up man at the location where I was at in my workplace. And I do not date coworkers at all, but I just had this vibe. And I told myself, you know what, I'm going to just plant a seed with him. And if he bites back, you know, if he takes it great, if not great. So I went to my little small circle at work and I said, Hey, you work with him more than I do. You know, please keep this to yourself. I'm thinking about reaching out to him romantically. I've never done this before, but let me know if he, is he the work fuck boy or, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> him. and they said, go for it. He's wonderful. Go for it. And I said, perfect. Cause that was my instincts because what I was really attracted to was his leadership style, the way he worked with his team and the numbers that he has done at work. And it's really mm -hmm. phenomenal. So I reached out to him about a week before my last day. Again, I don't date coworkers, but I figured a week before would be fine before I left. And I said to him, you know, I really liked your leadership style, enjoyed working with you, and I want to help you be successful when I leave. I'd love to get a drink with mm. you to talk about my experience with you. And he was completely down with it. 
Well, all of a sudden it turned into more work. And then we got very intimate, very fast, very close. And it got very romantic about a week or so later. So romantic that he booked a weekend in Seattle for us a week after we connected. So, yeah. (laughs) Wait, I I feel like there's a missing piece. How did it go from we want to talk about work to intimate that you're booking trips to Seattle? Well, well, we started. How many drinks did that take? (laughs) I'm just that good, y'all. I'm just that good. True. (laughs) No, he. He just started, we were just talking on texts and phone calls. It just turned into this, you know, which is a natural conversation. We really just connected in our communications and we went on a date the Sunday before. I mean, he just, we just went really fast and we went on our first date the week before and just really connected. He stayed with me two days later when I went to San Diego to see my friend on my farewell tour for work. And then that weekend we were in Seattle, moved very, very fast. Wait, this, I feel like this story is juicier than the workaholic bit right now. Okay, so I, I feel like I want <laughs> we'll more get details. to the workaholic on. bit, but yeah. we want to go here. Yeah. We'll get there first. But I think the starter of this relationship is probably what's most fascinating for a lot of people listening right now. So I, I just want to ask a few more questions about this stage. We're, okay, mm-hmm. so when you reached out to him, this is purely for work purposes. When was the turning point? Mm-hmm. What was like the tipping point, I guess? When when you both felt safe to talk about your relationship in a romantic sense. I started talking to him about my experience of in California because he said, you know, was it California or was it the job while you're leaving? And I said a little bit of both. And then, and he's been single for about four years. He, uh, about four years ago, he went through a divorce. Oh. Yeah. So we had that connection because there's not a lot of single men at my work or my previous job. <laughs> <laughs> and we started talking and I said, you know, I know you're single too. How has dating been for you? And, you know, he said a little bit, not that much dating either. Like I haven't dated that much. So I opened up with him and I said, this is my experience with dating. And then he told me his experience. So, so I felt me personally, I felt heard when he was listening to me about my, my work situation, what I was sharing with him, which led me to open up and like, how can I go a little bit deeper? Cause I have a little warm and fuzzies with him. Which is interesting because the pandemic, not dating Mm -hmm. can mean so many different reasons. It could Mm -hmm. be that you're a workaholic. It could be that you're concerned about your safety. It could be so many different varieties. So I guess at what point did you realize that you felt like this guy was a workaholic oh gosh so we're about to get real intimate here Uh. y'all so (laughs) just get ready i know i know so when he was with me in san diego that was the first time we were like super intimate like you know what couples do in the bedroom all the way and (laughs) thanks thanks for spelling um, it out for us (laughs) what couples do really intimate have sex So, oh gosh. So we were, it was about 6 a.m. the next morning and he was reading his emails. And to give context to him, and maybe we can elaborate it later, is he's a very high up in supply chain. And unless you're living under a rock or haven't been to the grocery stores lately, supply Uh chain is a very, very difficult industry, very difficult. And it's a 24 hour job. So I kind of give him grace for that. But we were, um, he was checking emails and then we started being intimate, having sex. And then he left in the middle of it. He said, I got to be there for my team. I in have the middle. To go. In the middle. Like he oh. just pulled out of me. And <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was there like a meeting that he was going to? Or was it more just a hypothetical idea? My brain is on work right this minute. My brain is on work at this minute. <gasps> oh, my God. Instead of whiskey dick, he had work dick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, what does this have to do with numbers or performance or your team right now? Like, you're intimate with me. What? Right. Like, that's running through your head right this minute as we're doing this. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I text my close friends after he left. I said, my name is Caitlin. I think I'm dating a workaholic. (laughs) And then did this continue? Like, dating him wise or just this behavior, the work, the workaholic tendencies? Um, Well, we went to Seattle that weekend because he told me before he left, after that moment, he said, I'll be more available, more present this weekend. I promise. I said, okay, maybe out of sight, out of mind, different state, maybe he'll be more present. It did not show up intimately, but when we were out in Seattle that weekend, he was checking emails. He was still talking Mm. to people. He was talking to me about work. I want to say at least combined together between the two days, we were there at least six hours of the time. So these were both on weekends when it was like on able to detach from work. We're not even talking about like midday 
being in the thick of it. Well, the San Diego incident where we hooked up, that was a Wednesday morning. Okay. So so that's why he said, you know, I'll be more present this weekend when we're in Seattle. I said, okay. He was still checking emails and working for about six hours that weekend. Wow. Julie, I'm rereading your definition of an <laughs> alcoholic or workaholic, keep saying <laughs> alcoholic, who is someone who works excessively. Yup. We saw that come through compulsively. Yeah. Pulling yep. out of you in the middle sex, com- pretty damn compulsive and unable to detail attached from work like he hit all three to a Mm -hmm. t from just that one weekend yeah and you know i try to give him grace too because again he's very high up in supply chain and it's a very very hard industry right now and i feel like there's workaholics pre-covid and like y'all mentioned you know in covid it's very easy to be a workaholic but i look at our leaders you know vp senior vice president ceos you know of any company it's like a different level of empathy and compassion mm-hmm. that you have to have as a leader because people are burnt out people are frustrated yep. they're exhausted so there might be some sort of guilt or you know if you step away from however many people you manage you might feel like i'm letting them down because they're so frustrated and i have to keep, i feel like i have to be there present at all times to keep them motivated so it's like a different kind of workaholic that's a really good point because we're in the great resignation also mm-hmm. so i think yes yeah, some of it's probably the empathy base that you just brought up but also probably the fear of losing people too and just creating more work to rehire and all that Oh, absolutely. That was a big concern when I put in my resignation. They said, whoa, you're a high performer. We need to talk. So why are you Mm. leaving? They were very, very concerned. Which is a good segue because you are someone that's career oriented yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like you're just like, I don't care about my career. I just want to date. That's the only thing that's important to me because we know you. We know that's not the case. So I guess like, how do you find balance in your dating life to separate career in personal life a bit more? You know, I'll just to back it up a little about five years ago, my last long term relationship ended. And for about a year and a half um, after that, I first discovered the dating apps, I was super hardcore into my work, I dated someone for about three months in a turbo relationship, which ended up being me being ghosted. Around that time, all my friends were dating, getting married, having kids. And I just was bottling up all my emotions. And finally, it just broke one day when I walked into work. I just cracked, um, read an email. My company is merging with an industry giant. I just broke down. I thought, wow, the one thing I had going for me is probably going to be taken away. So I realized at that point, you know, once you put yourself all into work, you're really missing out on things in life because you're you could just you're just a number. You could be axed immediately or a pandemic can wipe your industry away. So for me, I realized if I want to be a better teammate professionally, if I want to be a better partner, a better sister, a better friend, I need to have that balance because when I'm rejuvenated, when I exit, I'm more present and just a better person overall. So that moment, that whole year and a half where I just bottled up my emotions and then I cracked when my work was potentially taken away from me when I realized, you know what? It's not got a balance. Yeah, that's a really good point because how you treat work actually bleeds into your personal life and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And just from my own experience, some of my worst managers have been the ones who've been bitterly single and not dating and refusing to connect with humans. And they're at work till 10 p.m. And they expect you to be at work until 10 p.m. as well. And it doesn't do much for team morale that way. Yeah, I mean, I definitely consider myself a career oriented person too. But I think like, there's this saying that on your deathbed, you're never asking if you could have worked more hours, you want to have more hours to spend with your loved ones. And especially at corporate America, you said this, Caitlin, you can get replaced in a second. If something if something was to happen to you, there would be a job description up within hours to try to backfill you. Where your personal life, you can't backfill someone that way because there's so much more that goes into it. So I think there is, you know, work is important. It's not like it's not important. It gives us purpose. It also helps us financially pay for things. But then there also needs to be the line of this isn't my whole world either. And I wish I had that with the workaholic. Um, situationship I'm in because, you know, he talked to me about his divorce from four years ago and people go into work. I feel like people put their effort into work too, to cover their emotions. They might be feeling Mm -hmm. things just judging on the actions I've seen with him. I don't think he has separated the, that those two yet. 
I think a lot of people do that. I know I've been there before when, you know, going mm-hmm. through a breakup, it's easier to suppress emotion and just funnel all your energy into work. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you're succeeding at work, when you're putting your work into it and you're succeeding, it, it's kind of addictive, you know, you just fall into that trail. Well, it makes you feel like you have something under control. If you don't have your personal life under control, at least at work, you feel valued. So now that you're in the situation ship and you haven't known him for that long in a romantic sense, have you been able to call him out on some of this behavior? You know, after Seattle, um, I felt him get a little distant and I could, my gut was talking and I thought, you know, it's my first week at the new job. Maybe he's giving me distance. Work is, you know, work is work. But then finally I said, I need to speak to him. So I said to him, look, my gut is talking right now. Our vibe is off. Again, my gut is talking and I'm just reaching out to you to see how you're feeling. And he said, well, I'm not planning on leaving California for a few years. You're, you're going to Florida. How can this really work? And you said, you, you're considering Florida being your forever home. What does this mean? And I said, okay, I see where you're going with this. Mm-hmm. You know, nice. You're a great p- memory of California. I I'm glad you were part of my time, short time here. And he said, no, I still want to be friends. You know, I'll come see you in hmm. Florida and I'll come travel. But he st- hasn't planned anything. He hasn't really been vocal about seeing me ever since then. So I'm not quite sure if his words and actions are lining up right now. Interesting. It's kind of just now faded a bit. But was there anything you said when some of this behavior was coming in around work-life balance? Or do you have any discussions with him? I mean, I made comments to him like, hey, like, stop, I stop. And he just, I don't think he could stop. I did like, I didn't really have the long conversations. It was just very light. And how did you react when he pulled his penis out of you <laughs> mid romp to think about work? I was speechless. I started questioning, <laughs> was it me? Is it me? Did I do something wrong? But then when he said, I'll be fully present this weekend, I clicked. Mm. It clicked at that point that it wasn't me. It was it was him. I feel like we kind of skipped over um, Julie because I feel like you've dated workaholics before. Love mm-hmm. to hear your experience of what you had to deal with. Mm. Yes, I definitely dated a workaholic. <laughs> Maybe there was one person that particularly stood out. And I think one thing that I dealt with was it was always on their terms. At first, I thought it was really awesome that this person was making all the plans and deciding what restaurants to go to and booking the reservations. I was like, finally, someone super proactive. But I quickly realized that Anytime I suggested something, it was not met because it was all around his work schedule. And that was what was driving the proactiveness. So I think that was one piece that was challenging with it. I think the other was that it like plans would get broken during, you know, there were times that we had plans and it was like, oh, I have to work late. And it didn't really feel like there was a remorse from it. And I mean, I don't know what their work schedule was really like. Like maybe it was so urgent that they couldn't do the plans of me, but I had trouble seeing that. So I guess what I would have hoped for is one, is that really actually the truth? Like, could you do it tomorrow, you know, and still make that room for someone? Or was this just you saying you didn't want to make room for someone? But then also if it truly was like, I need to do this tonight, having more visibility into that. And I think that's where it goes back to the community communication aspect of just getting like, oh, sorry, I got to work late. That doesn't do it unless you're really sharing what's going on for you. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess you have you ever dated a workaholic? (laughs) I've never dated a workaholic in the traditional sense. But from this discussion, I realized I've dated someone who was married to their work and I was their mistress. And that didn't Mm -hmm. make me feel good. It didn't mean that he was working all the time, but he certainly talked about his work in a much better light that he was talk about me. And he would often, during our short-lived relationship, he would often text me articles, like TechCrunch articles about his industry and his company. Yet his coworkers knew nothing about me except for my name. But I knew everything about his coworkers. So that was a huge red flag. He was 
married to the sexy company and I was mm-hmm. just there for a distraction. And even after we broke up, he was still sending me articles about his company that IPO'd. And oh my God, look at how we're doing. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> you know, I'm, I don't work there. <laughs> Why are you sending me this? I have the same thing happen with the workaholic I just mentioned <laughs> is that once we called it, he would send me articles all the time. He didn't send them about his company, but he would send them about I was working at Yahoo at the time. So he would send them about the tech industry. And it would almost be like his way to get back in touch. But it would just be like him sending a TechCrunch article after not right. speaking for weeks. And it was like, what does this mean? And of course, I would start to like wonder if this was a sign that things were back on because I... <laughs> You know, was clearly not as enlightened as I am now. This was many, many years ago. But I think that was a big thing that a a lot of our communication was done through his work email, which was super weird. What? Looking back on it. Yes. Like he wouldn't even text all the time. It would just be sent from his work email. And I'm like, why would you even want these? And some of them were a little racy. I'm like, why would you want this in a paper trail from your work email? But I think it's like he couldn't even detach that much to go to personal email. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. I think this never like directly affected me, but a sign was that he also had told me that like he was supposed to go home for the holidays one year and actively chose not to mm. so he could work. So I think that's actually a good way to understand someone's relationship with work, too. It might not be how they show up for you, but how do they show up for other people in their lives? If you're dating someone successful, but they balance friends and family well, then that could be a sign that they have better balance than someone that has no friends, doesn't ever see their family. You know, like that's a big piece of it. That's a good point because I turned in my notice for my job in Florida right before the holidays. And my mom said, are you sure you want to come home? Do you want to start packing, you know, get moving? And I said, nope, I want to see my family because might not ever see all ever again. So I'm not going to turn this down. I will be there for the holidays. That's huge. I think that's such an important question to ask in early dating is who are the closest people in your life and how do you show up for them? And I can guarantee you that guy I dated would have named five of his co-workers including his boss <laughs> <laughs> it's like my best friend is my boss <laughs> Yeah. My angel investor is my BFF. Yeah, yeah exactly. Ex- that's exactly what it was. We went to a wedding of one of the angel investors of this company. Like, do you know anything about him or you just know he has money? Let's hold that thought for a few quick messages. This episode is brought to you by Murad Skincare, a line of clinically proven, cruelty free products that meet the meticulous standards for safety, efficacy, and care you expect from a doctor. One of my favorite products is the Invisiscar resurfacing treatment, which I've already seen some results from, from using it for just a few weeks. Founded by Dr. Howard Murad, who is a board certified dermatologist and trained pharmacist, recognized around the world as a visionary for his unmatched scientific innovations, Murad has also launched a digital magazine and a podcast. Podcast called Well Connected by Murad, connecting the dots between science and wellness. Find the digital magazine at wellconnected.murad.com and the podcast Well Connected by Murad wherever you listen to your podcast. And for dateable listeners only, go to murad.com and enter the code dateable for 20% off and free shipping for orders of $60 or more. Again, that's murad.com and enter the code dateable, D A T E A B L E, for 20% off and free shipping for $60 or more. This episode is sponsored by Vaya. We all know there are things that can help set the mood in the bedroom, but did you know a little THC could also do that? Yes, Vaya has developed a unique blend of pleasure-enhancing cannabinoids, libido-strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind-blowing gummy called High Love. This gummy, wow, it will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. I've been pleasantly surprised by the High Love gummies because it is just the right amount of THC THC for me to have a good time without feeling sleepy. And hey, if THC is not your thing, Vaya also offers a wide array of other gummies without it. And everything legally ships in 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. So if you're over 21, you can get 15% off and a free pack of award-winning Dreams THC plus CBN sleep gummies with our exclusive code DATEABLE at viahemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Let the gummies work their magic. Head to 
to viahemp.com and use a code DATEABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their sleepy dream gummies. That's viahemp.com and use a code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E at checkout. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. As you know, I recently left my corporate job and I've been in total recovery mode all about self-care. One of my new routines is the nighttime shower before bed. There's just something about washing away the day and that reflection that's been super helpful for me. I've been using one of our partners, Osea's Mega Moisture Duo. This combo body oil and body lotion are so freaking incredible. It literally feels like I'm at a spa. I realize that the secret is seaweed and other skin level ingredients that are normally reserved for face products. And that's why I was so excited when Osea became one of our partners. And, you know, we're so grateful for partners like this because one, they keep the show going, but they're also super good for all of our listeners and for our own well-being. So if you want to have that nighttime bliss like I am doing, you can get 10% off your first order site-wide with code DATEABLE at OseaMalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over for $60. So head to OSEAMalibu.com and use the code DATEABLE for 10% off. Let us know which products you end up going with. Share them in social. Super excited to see what you end up choosing. Living with ADHD can be a challenge and dating with ADHD is definitely a challenge. We've heard many of you say, but finding the right care and proper tools needed to succeed can be life-changing. Done is an online ADHD care platform that can get you all the resources you need to help manage your ADHD. Online visits, refills, and a 24-7 care team made for you. In just one minute, Dunn's online assessment can help kickstart your ADHD treatment journey. With experienced clinicians, worry fill refills, and online visits, you can start getting personalized care as soon as today or tomorrow. So contact an expert team that can help you around the clock and get a personalized treatment plan just for you. Here's how you do it. Take a free one-minute assessment and book an appointment with a licensed ADHD clinician as soon as the next day. Get continuous care, one-click refills, insurance coverage, and 24-7 care team support with Done for just $79 a month. And pharmacy co-pays as low as $0. Visit get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. That's get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. Done. Turn ADHD into your strength. And you also have dated people across the spectrum in terms of occupation. And I just know you because you are one of our moderators in our Facebook group that you have shared an experience that a long-term relationship ended because the person wasn't career oriented enough and motivated enough, basically the opposite side of the spectrum. (laughs) I guess what is kind of for anyone that doesn't know you, what is kind of your background with people in occupations and how has there been, you know, pros and cons of both? Oh gosh, where to begin? I feel like I've dated them all. I mean, I watched Sex in the City in college. And for some reason, I felt like I just had to translate my dating in that. So I have dated bartenders. I have dated um, VPs in tech, I, a VP in tech, entrepreneurs. Uh, gosh, I've dated them all, I feel like. And there are pros and cons to both. So my last long-term relationship that ended five years ago, he was hourly at Home Depot. I mean, very complacent, not super career driven, but he was the sweetest and most loyal man I ever dated. And he let me be free. He didn't care what I did. He trusted me, but he was also just eh, like complacent about everything. Um, whereas before him, my previous long-term relationship before him was a military officer, which was completely different, of completely different personality. He was very regimented and I like routine, but I also don't like being told what to do all the time. So that was one career that did not work out for me. I've also dated VVP very high in tech and we connected on so many things emotionally, but uh, it was a turbo relationship, with, which ended up with me being ghosted after three months of traveling all over the country. So, you know, they all have different stories and, you know, it does, I've noticed, you know, the higher up men are just from my experience, I don't want to generalize, but the higher up men are, the more they're so successful in the boardroom, they can do anything and lead teams of 300, hundreds. But in their personal life, again, I'm generalizing just from my experience, they're not all emotionally there. Like they're just not, their emotional intelligence is very far and few to find. Whereas 
you know, the hourly from Home Depot, he knew me very well. He picked up on the little details. He was there for me. He he knew what my love languages were without me telling him. So, I mean, there's pros and cons, you know, do we want the motivated, emotionally unavailable, driven man? Or do we go with the complacent, loyal, sweet, hourly worker? Right. And it doesn't always have to be one or the other. I know you're generalizing Mm -hmm. just on experience, but I think you do raise a good point that just because you have the skills necessary to lead a business doesn't mean that you have the skills necessarily to lead a relationship. And I think a lot of times we struggle with relational skills because um, our generation particularly has put career first a lot of times. And that results in getting into relationships later in life and maybe not even knowing how to really navigate them. Yeah, that was that was interesting because I dated a man very high up in Silicon Valley. And one thing I'll I'll never forget, one thing he said to me was, I am so jealous that you can be alone and be okay with it. Like you can go home to an empty place and you're fine. Whereas I have to have someone, I have to do it. I have to just be around someone at all times to come home to. And I think to myself, you have changed the world with what you d- you've mm-hmm. done, but you can't go home a- and sit alone. I mean, that was really mind blowing to me because just because they're a certain way in the boardroom doesn't mean they're that confident um, when they go home. Yeah. And I think that's the conflict that we see too, is a lot of men that we've spoken to have often said, I have to get my career in place before I can focus on my mm-hmm. personal life. But for many people, once they think they've reached that point in their career where they have it made or they've succeeded, then they have a lot of catching up to do when it comes to their personal life because it's been years since they had to have like a a, a very real relationship. And a friend of mine comes to mind. He just recently sold his startup. He was in a complacent relationship, didn't work on it. And the moment he sold his startup, he broke up with a 15 year whatever that was and said, I need an actual relationship now. Where do I start? How do I begin? So how do we... I mean, we're going to see more and more of this. And I don't, I'm, I'm saying this for men only because the men have spoken out, but I'm sure it happens with women as well. As we see more and more of this in our generation, how do we, I guess, let's go from the person dating the <laughs> the person who's a workaholic. How do we support them, but also draw boundaries at the same time? I started not initiating first in the morning. I found myself um, initiating. I thought, you know what? I'm going to set the boundaries that this isn't. This is not going to be a one way street. It's going to be a two way. I haven't heard from him in two days since I haven't initiated. So just changing up your actions. I feel like for communication, set that boundary. Yeah, I think there's. Uh, we've heard this before from experts too that have said this that there's getting out of work mode before you go on date mode, mm. and maybe that's just decompressing in a way that you can you know, have that delineation a bit more. And if you're dating someone that has workaholic tendencies, encouraging them to kind of finish up what they need to finish up, even if that means Mm. you meet up a half an hour later, but just so it can be done and then you can move into the date mode. And I say this from someone that is probably the workaholic in my relationship (laughs) and I've dealt with this. So So I guess that's an example of women. I think it it runs both ways. I don't think this is a male exclusive thing at all. So that's a really good point. I have my own personal rules when I date. I only date on the weekends, like first dates, Mm. until I get comfortable with you. I will not date Monday through Friday because I'm not fully present because I know Mm -hmm. how much, how hard I work. I'm not going to show up and just talk your ear off about work at happy hour when I want to get to know you and be in the right mindset. So that's my personal role with dating. And I actually brought this up with one date about two years ago. He wanted to see me more. He said, I want to see you more. I want to see you more. I said, I don't know you well enough to see you on a Tuesday yet. I will mm. please like you will mm. get the, a better date with me if we meet on Saturday or Sunday. And he really didn't like that. And we didn't work out. I like that because you know yourself so well that you can communicate when you are in the best mindset. If you're dating someone who's a workaholic, you also challenge them to think that way too. I want you and all of you. So give me the days and times that you think you can be fully present mm. or I don't want to see you because it doesn't it doesn't do any of us any good. That's a good point. If workaholic reaches out to me, I can say that to him. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, I think that's important. And I think not having your phone out when you're on the date mm-hmm. is really important too, because, you know, we're so glued to our phones in this day and age. If he, I'm guessing, probably like saw out of the corner of it, his eye something, an email go through or a calendar mm-hmm. invite, if you see that, you, it's hard not to respond to it. Mm-hmm. So I think just putting it in your like bag or in your coat pocket or something away when you're in date mode time is super important because then you don't even have that temptation. Absolutely. He probably was checking emails when I'd like go to the restroom yeah. or mm-hmm. you know, walk away for a second. I think I used to have a rule too of just not talking about date work. Like I didn't like mm. to talk about work on dates. It wasn't like a rule I necessarily communicated, but for me, I wouldn't I wouldn't hide anything. If someone brought uh, asked me what I did for work, I would obviously tell them, but I would try to move the conversation along into something a little more fun and upbeat, especially for the first date because it's important to understand someone and where they're coming from and what drives them. But I think you could do that later on. What I wouldn't want to get sucked into is the mundane aspects of work. Because let's be honest, if you're not in someone's industry, you don't want to hear about that anyways. No. And even if you are, when you're out for drinks, it's questionable if you want to hear about it. No. No. If, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's not exciting at all. And there's something very fascinating that happens because we had an episode about dating the CEO of a startup. And the entire 60 minutes, this guy is talking about how he's not ready to date. He doesn't have the time to date. He's married to his work and his staff are his kids. And we received like 50 emails after this episode Mm. aired of women who (laughs) said, I'm okay with that lifestyle or I'm ready to change your lifestyle. And I think we just have to be on these first early dates. Just take it at face value. This is what this person's saying. If they say they're not ready to date, they don't have time to date, they really do mean it. And if you think you can be okay with that lifestyle, I think it's better to really like be honest with yourself and ask, am I really okay with this lifestyle? I used to be that person who thought, oh yeah, I could totally date an executive who has, you know, maybe sees me once every other week and it's fine because they're high up and the time I get to spend with them, it's fine. I've also realized I'm not that person anymore. I I can't deal with that because that's not a relationship in my eyes. Yeah. I mean, I think the other piece, like I mentioned, I would try not to talk about work on dates, but I don't think that that means that you can't hear how they view work. Mm. And I loved always asking people the question too, like if you like, you know, won the lottery or something that basically made you never have to work again, what would you do Mm -hmm. to hear kind of like what they like, you know, what, how their mind operated around work or also just asking them like, what was important in your life? Like from an accomplishment perspective, just understand their why behind working too. Because I think that's something that we haven't hit on yet is that work does mean different things for different people. And some people are workaholics by choice because they've got extra time or they're just wired that way. But other people might be workaholics out of necessity based on financial means or if they're supporting children, like there could be other reasons behind it. So I think understanding someone's why of why they work so much is really important. I love this. This speaks to me because I used to go on dates and, and, you know, they say, oh, what do you do? And I say, I'm a marketing manager in a food industry where I would switch it and say, I would lead more with, I help restaurants survive. I help Mm. restaurants do their thing. I help restaurants stay creative, which leads more into my passion of keeping the arts in school, how passionate I am for artists to make it and creativity and people connection, which leads more into that rather than my day-to-day work. So it's really how you market it on the date because the CEO of a tech startup can say, I'm the CEO of tech startup, or they can say, I'm providing um, tech solutions to certain markets to help them survive. Mm, that's a great point. I think we are so tied to our titles that we're not tied mm-hmm. to the purpose of the title. Right. So maybe a better question on a date rather than what do you do is what's your purpose at work? What are you accomplishing mm-hmm. there? That's a lot mm-hmm. more telling than I'm a senior customer success manager at right. Salesforce. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like that doesn't cool. mean anything. Good for you. Oh, I'm level three <laughs> customer success manager. Super. I would definitely date that person. Yeah. <laughs> you have dated that person. Julie. You had me at customer success level three, not two. 
just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I'm not in tech. That doesn't mean shit to me. I don't know what that means. <laughs> what if it's a power couple that both people are super career oriented, career comes above everything else? Could that work? Or is it doomed to just be a surface level relationship? <laughs> What's that term we talked about months ago? Dual income, no kids? Dink. Yeah. Dink. dink. Yep. yep. <laughs> the dink couple. I don't know. I'd, I've never seen a dink. I don't think so. I know this couple. Mm. I know this couple. I've seen it. Both of them are very savvy in their careers. They're very high up and they spend all their quality time trying to brainstorm ways to accomplish even more in their professional careers. Mm. And then over a decade goes by and they realize they are just business partners and there's nothing romantic that is happening. And that's when you have infidelity. That's when you start moving to different cities and saying, we can make it work. It's for our careers, but we can make this work. I personally just don't see that happening. If two people cannot prioritize their relationship, then that relationship is definitely doomed. Well, I remember we had Amanda Bradford on mm. years ago. I think it was season two. and She's the CEO of the league. And we asked her if she would date mm. another CEO. And she, her response was, neither one of us would plan anything. <laughs> right? <laughs> We'd basically both be too busy that nothing would ever get off the ground. It's kind of like two avoidant people dating. Just nothing mm -hmm. ever happens. And of course, there's always exceptions to the rule. But I think maybe power couples that have that that can carve out that together time and have that balance have more of a fighting chance than if you're always on work mode. Yeah. Well, one thing I noticed with the workaholic, um, this was very interesting to me. I moved to California right before the pandemic and I had not a lot of intimacy or dating for about two, the two years I was here. Physical touch was pretty much non-existent while I was here. But I noticed with him, one way I really got him to open up and just I could feel his body change was simple physical touch. I would touch his back. I would link arms with him. Mm. Things I normally don't do, but because I've had such lacking of physical touch, I just felt my, like, just geared toward those sm simple, small things. I mean, we were that couple on the airplane where I'm holding up to his arm, I'm snuggled up to him, and I loved it, and I could, he received it so well. So I thought, okay, this is how he responds. Like, he's a completely different person. I could feel a change in him on that. And I think if you're a power couple and you don't have that connection, you're not going to work, you know, like you saw UA, but I just picked up on that intimacy of physical touch and how important that is in a relationship with him. I will say the flip side though, because I do know some people that are very work oriented, but I do think they're able to turn it on and off. But I think the benefits of, you know, people that are CEOs or startup founders or something that really takes a lot of diligence is that they're very committed. Mm -hmm. They'll do what it takes to make things work at all costs. And I think that actually can be an important trait in a partnership because you do want someone that you know once they're once they're in and once they're like this is what I'm doing I'm doing it like I don't know some of the people I'm thinking of also are endurance athletes and I think it has similar <laughs> characteristics to that too right just like a drive to keep going with something and I think there can be a flip side that is beneficial in relationships as long as you can find some of the balance then I would argue those people are prioritizing their relationship that's true. That's what the commitment mm -hmm. is about, right? So it's not about being career oriented. It's about making time for a relationship also. Absolutely. I mean, I was going to say that I think our society likes to romanticize busyness. Everyone's busy. Oh, goodness. Mm -hmm. I'm so busy all the time. And we hear daters making excuses for the people they're seeing, saying, oh, I haven't seen this person in a while. They're so busy. They're really high up at work or they're going through school right now. They're getting an MBA. We got to stop making excuses for busyness because nobody's that busy. The busyness no. comes from what people create for themselves, but there are plenty of hours in a day to not be busy. And if someone says they're too busy, that's a red flag. Let's talk about where this busyness is coming from. What are you hiding from? Right. Well, people want to make time for what they want to make time for at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I think if they truly are so busy with work, then that means that that's their priority and it's not a relationship. And ultimately, it doesn't matter what, like, what they're hiding from if they're not ready to be in a relationship with you. It's not your 
role to be like Nancy Drew and investigate and figure out <laughs> what is going on with them. You know, I was thinking, you know, before this interview, you know, how do you break, how does a workaholic stop becoming one? You know, how mm-hmm. do they do it? And I, and I don't think it comes from me or anyone else. It comes from within. I feel like they have to maybe hit a point like I did, crack and think, yep. you know what? I'm losing, I'm missing the real point of life right now. Yeah. I want to bring that to this conversation then because, mm-hmm. okay, so we talked about there is a difference between being career oriented and being a workaholic. Mm-hmm. And the line really is making room for other relationships versus not. How do we then manage career, whether we're dating or in relationships? Like how, we gave a few tips of separating time, but that's not always realistic, especially if the relationship progresses. I know, Caitlin, you mentioned like you would only do things on the weekends until you got comfortable, but eventually you're going to get comfortable and you're going to want this person there. How do we think that we can balance career in relationships? Magic. (laughs) Create more hours. I mean, isn't that the million dollar question? Because we're all maximizers. So everyone wants to maximize their professional life as well as their personal life. I think ultimately what I've seen with some of my workaholic friends is they crack when it comes time for a celebration, celebrating an accomplishment. They sell their startup, a milestone birthday, and nobody's there to to celebrate with them. Mm. That loneliness really Mm. sets in, right? Mm -hmm. So you accomplish all of this, but you have nobody to share it with. So I feel like the answer to your question, Julie, is about constant sharing of a life with someone and knowing that when you go on these dates, even if you're not completely intimate yet, sharing more of your life with them and, uh, and allowing them inside of who you are, I think will create more of that, less of that loneliness down the line. And I find that with a lot of workaholic tendencies, people close off and they, they don't want mm-hmm. you to get too close because they don't want you to see their weaknesses. But sometimes being vulnerable is exactly what will help you to become more successful when it comes to your personal and professional life. That speaks to my soul so much, UA. I I would love to celebrate my accomplishments with someone. I just haven't found them yet. And I would just, I'm dying for that. And that's one thing I really liked about the workaholic is I felt heard when I mm-hmm. talked to him about work. I felt, lis- I mean, he's a great listener and which is why he's a really good leader at his job. He's a great listener, very compassionate and just really made me feel like I could be myself with him. Yeah. No, I think that we all do want that person we can celebrate with. So I definitely could see that. I think you said something that actually reminded me of something that happened recently for me too. It's like this, how can you you know, set the expectations and how can you have this? Like, I think what I learned with my partner is sometimes I'll like do work when we're watching TV, for instance. And to Mm -hmm. me, it feels like downtime, but to him, it feels more like we're doing this activity and now I'm not present. So Mm -hmm. how can you say like, okay, we basically have the same expectation that this hour of TV is us doing an activity together versus saying, okay, this actually is us just having downtime and I can do my thing and you could do your thing. And ultimately, that is like a piece of it is communication, right? I think the fact it always comes back to communication. But I think a big piece of it is that because you were saying that some of the times that you felt slighted was when all of a sudden this person would start doing things like in your me time or the time that you both had together. So even just saying I need an hour today to kind of like take care of Mm -hmm. these things so I can put away my phone and we could be super present together, that could go a long way. I really like that. Especially if your love language is quality time. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's so great. I think every everybody should try to exercise that because especially with working from home, what I found with my partners, I don't know when they're working or not (laughs) because it's all the same. So one thing we start doing is that we change outfits when we're done working. We'll like literally (laughs) change it into Mm, our fun outfit. If I'm wearing my orange sweatsuit, it's like, oh yeah, okay, UA's off work now. She can, (laughs) she's ready to party, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I think that's what you need back, you know, back when we were in the office, you come home from work, it's like, okay, you're physically home, that means you're off work. But damn, working from home makes it really tricky. 
Definitely. So I guess like what tips would we have for anyone navigating this? If you were to go through this again, well, I guess you're kind of still in it. But if you were to navigate this differently, would you have addressed the situations in a different way at all? Absolutely. And I would have said to him, you know, this is where I am in my relationships. This is what I'm looking for. This is where I'm at in my career. And if you're available and present, and maybe just share my background too with people in you know, his type of role as well. And just see, are you going to be available and present? Because find the higher up you are, it's harder to be more available. Just really having those more vulnerable, open conversations instead of, because I felt like me and him were talking a lot about work because we used to work at the same place, but mm. maybe taking it a little bit le- um, deeper once we got to the more intimate conversations. I could see that, especially with a coworker being hard to mm-hmm. get out of that mm. boundary of work talk. It's almost yeah. like we need to set a boundary that we're not going to have any any work talk at all at dinner or something. And that's what I told him too. I actually said that to him. We maybe we're in San Diego or Seattle. I said, I hope we can stop talking about, you know, where we work at eventually as we evolve. And he said, Yes, I would like that too. Never really happened. <laughs> yeah, that's that's tough when like, you have so much work tea to talk about. <laughs> like it feels so good and it's comfortable. And it also also creates a little bit of intimacy when you have that bonding topic. Well, this has been such a great conversation. I mean, I think there's so many takeaways, but I think the biggest one that's standing out to me is that having a balance between work and life doesn't mean that you have to have to dim your light at all. It doesn't mean that you have to be ashamed of your work or, you know, put that as the back burner. Like, I think you can be loud and proud about work, but it doesn't mean that it needs to be the only thing going on for you. And if it is the only thing going on for you, how How can you bring more into your life or more people into your life to have that balance? Because I do think that, you know, said this at the end of the day, the most important thing is the people in your life and accomplishments are great because they give you a sense of purpose. That isn't going to be what you're thinking about on your deathbed. You're going to be thinking about the people and where you're wired for human connection and missing out on that aspect of life. You know, that is a shame in a way. So I think I'd hope Hope that people, if you're either dating a workaholic or you identify with workaholic tendencies yourself, it can be an opportunity to not say that someone could never do any work stuff again, but more of an opportunity to see how can we bridge this gap to have more of a balanced, fulfilling life. Mm hmm. I really like Mm -hmm. that. My major takeaway is we lack role models in work-life balance, especially in Silicon Valley, where we will suck Jeff Bezos' dick and Elon Musk (laughs) because, oh my goodness, there are the people to look up to in terms of what success is. And But we have to question, is that what success looks like? To make more money than God and to not have successful, healthy relationships. And look at Mark Zuckerberg, who has been married to the same woman forever, but he's considered boring because there's no drama that comes out of his life. Isn't that just a better place to be? So we just have to look to ourselves and think, what is a role model that I should be looking after? And I think the separation of work and personal life, and like you said, Julie, it doesn't have to be that you have to hide what you do, but you're. I think we can always find ways to enhance one place and the other. So your personal life can always enhance your professional life and vice versa. And the right partner will help enhance both scenarios Mm -hmm. versus like taking away or making you sacrifice. That should not be what a healthy relationship is about. And I hope we can just rewire the way we think about work and life. And it's not a completely a separate entity there. And finally, I think a great question to ask on first or second dates is, how do you like to date? What is your dating style? I think this says says so much about if someone's squeezing in dates in between mm-hmm. meetings or weekdays, or you get someone like Caitlin who says, I in- date intentionally only on weekends because I want to be fully present. That just says so much about someone's relationship to their time um, in general. So that those are my key takeaways. Caitlin, any words of advice for our listeners who may be either the workaholic or dating a workaholic? 
I think it's important to know who you are and what you will and will not put up with, what you will and will not stand for, having those core values. And you'll know when you meet someone whether your core values are shared or not. You'll know pretty instantly. So just knowing who you are and what you stand for and what's important to you and come to the table with that will help you identify those who will be um, the best match to share those with you. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us and shedding light on this topic. If there's anyone out there that wants to do the reverse, that they are recovering workaholic, that has mm. figured out how to balance both, then we would love to have that conversation too. But this was really great from someone that is very career oriented that I loved your story of how you were able to see the light at the end of the tunnel that you can make time for everything. Absolutely. And I hope to meet a partner who I can share that story with. You know, when I see your career oriented, when did you crack? When did you change? Any very um, work life balanced gentleman in Florida, that's a call out for you. <laughs> Caitlin is ready to meet you. She is new and she's single, ready to mingle, ready to not date a workaholic, but someone who is equally as enthusiastic about life as she is. All right, just saying. And career minded, <laughs> yes. And career minded yes. at the yes. same time. Okay, well, <laughs> thanks, you too. <laughs> thanks, Caitlin. Thanks for all of you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five star rating in Apple Podcasts, reviews, and also a little love note. We always love that. And um, with that said, we're going to wrap this up. Stay, Stay dateable. 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 The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag Stay Dateable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. Mm-hmm.